<clears throat> okay, so um, what we've been doing is a whole bunch of ANOVA. So I thought I'd start with why regression. So why are we switching? Actually, everything we've done in this class so far is regression. So I said this a couple times, that ANOVA is just a special type of regression. So if you have categorical IDs and continuous DVs, the ANOVA framework, and what I mean by that is like interpreting it as ANOVA is much easier. Um, if you, you can run all everything we've done so far using LM and doing it as a regression, it's just ANOVA is much, it has a better um, set of steps that are more interpretable. But now we're going to switch to uh, continuous IVs. So pretty much up to this point, we've been categorical IVs, continuous DVs. Now we're going to do continuous both. Uh, so it's just a type of analysis where I want to predict something. Uh, ANOVA is the same way. I'm predicting means using group membership. Now I'm predicting someone's score using their continuous score. So regression is much more flexible than ANOVA because uh, I don't have to have something be categorical or be in groups. It's actually easier if it doesn't. Okay, so we can use categorical variables. We can also use continuous variables. Do what you want. Okay. The DV has to be continuous still. Um, or you're going to do log. So we'll switch and do a, also a type where the <coughs> DV is categorical. And so if you think about statistics, really it boils down to what types of IVs and DVs do you have, and that tends to say what type of analysis you should do. So a little bit is a whole lot of definitions rather today. So our predictor variables are X. So these are our IVs. We're using them as independent variables to predict the DV, hence the name predictor. I use categorical, Likert, continuous, whatever. Mostly we're going to focus on continuous variables because, like I said, if your <coughs> variables are all categorical, just do ANOVA. <clears throat> the criterion variable, or Y, this is the DV, and this is what we're trying to predict. It's called a criterion variable because we're using it as a criterion to determine if our IVs are any good. So if our predictor variables predict Y well, that's the like goal of measure. Like, we're trying to figure out how they got these scores using these other variables. So we're trying to figure out how to make IVs predict DVs or X predicting Y. <coughs> uh, trying to use some of the same terms we've been using. A criterion is a new one. <coughs> so let me draw this. This is a really just very simple ggplot thing that I had up in for my other class. So let's say we're trying to predict um, something I've been working on today, course grade. And we've been using help sessions. So you guys actually have analyzed this data. Uh, this is the SI data. So we're seeing if you go to more help sessions, do you get a higher course grade? Okay. As a way to get the administration to continue to pay for the um, help desk people. And in a perfect world, there's a great correlation between the two. <coughs> So where it crosses the y-axis is x, the slope, I'm sorry, a. I said x and I wrote an a. A, where it crosses, where the slope or the steepness of the variable is b. So we're talking about two equations here. y hat is a plus bx. If you've taken a traditional math class, they tend to say y is an x plus b. Same idea. <coughs> Or y hat equals beta x. <coughs> We're going to go with these terms. So when I'm referring to a and b, I put this picture in here so you'd have it later, but we can look at the one on the board. <coughs> so the point of regression <coughs> is to see if we can create an equation that best explains the relationship between x and y. So if I have lots of x's, I always keep adding them on over here. bx, bx. So I'm trying to come up with a score. So y hat is their predicted score. We're going to go through each one of these one at a time. Plus some intercepts, some a variable, plus a weighted slope times x. Because not all predictors are the same. So we have to weight them on how useful they are at predicting y. So one at a time. Let's start with A. So A is your constant. 
or the y intercept. And A is uh, also the um, average Y. So the way to think about A is that's where people start if X is zero. So when X is zero, or X is equal to zero, here's what Y is. Um, these aren't traditionally reported very often. They have to, like, you usually have to have a reason why you're reporting them. So we have a study that we're using them, but most of the time it just kind of gets ignored. But it just depends. So my help session study, this would be the average course grade, ignoring x. Okay, so this is where people start. So at no help sessions is what people are doing. Here is the average grade. Um, and then if we add help sessions, how much better are they getting? Um, I think people don't think about this as being important because it's basically if x didn't exist, here's what the average score is. But you're wanting x to be a thing, to be important. So I think that's why people tend to ignore it. Okay, so the slope here is b. This is a lowercase b. Uh, and sometimes it's called the coefficient. In R, you'll see it listed as coef or coefficient. So this is the unstandardized slope. Okay. <clears throat> and I get asked this interpretation question a lot, so I tried to make it bold. Like, this is how you interpret them. Okay. So for every one point increase in x, you'd b points increase in y. I feel like this goes back to like basic algebra. People haven't thought about this in a way, because we're usually so concerned with significance that we forget sometimes, like, what does this actually mean? Um, and so for me, this was a big selling point on this paper that we're working on. So for every one help session, right, this is a nice interpretation, they get 0.05 GPA points. That's after we control for how smart they are. So if they went to 10 help sessions with a half a letter grade, you went to 20 with a whole letter grade. So that's really good a sell for um, <coughs> administrators. Right, trying to make this conceptualize. If I told them that the coefficient was 0.05, they would look at me and be like, and? But if I said, hey, every 10 sessions a student went to, they got a half a letter grade better, they're calculating, like, we can keep them here, and they're going to be counted, they're going to count more for tuition. So we were like, if they're offering 30 sessions, here's how much tuition money that you're going to keep because the students are going to stay, are going to stay on campus. That seems to work better when you talk about money. <laughs> Big shock. Right. But... When I would report this, I'd talk about B as 0.05. Well, what that meant was for every one session that people went to, their final course grade increased 0.05 points. Okay, so for every 10 they went to, that was a half a letter grade. Now, it's unstandardized, which means this last thing is true. The score is based on the scale, the variable you're working with. So if instead of help session here, I had previous GPA, now it's for every one GPA point, which is a totally different interpretation. So that's going from you know C to B. Here's what happens. Um, so what was it? It was, I think, one point. Right. So if we control for their course grade, so we use their previous MSU GPA to predict their final course grade. Right. If they're normally C students, but they're in an SI class, they're normally getting Bs. So just being in a class with this extra component tends to raise their letter grade an extra letter. Um, so having the extra help sessions helps as well. Okay. Um, so it depends on the scale of the variable. That's the important part. The problem with B is that you can't compare Bs because they are in the scale of their own variable. So I put a star here. So I often ask why beta. Hey, why are there two of them? Um, beta is a standardized scale. So it's a z-score. I don't think I have that written down. No. It's a z-score B. Um, so when we want to compare things, I feel like the solution is always like z-score them. So we, do, we did lots of z-scoring. That's what we use for outliers. We... Um, 
use that scale function when we're comparing, doing the homogeneity plots so that zero is always in the middle for us. Um, so the solution to being able to compare V values, because I can't compare help sessions to GPA, because GPA's got four points, right? It's, that's five points, zero to four. But help sessions range from zero to 45. They're not the same scale. I use beta. So beta is a standardized slope, so it's a z-score. Um, and the interpretation is kind of tricky. So for every one SD increase in x, you get, that should be a beta right there, beta increases in y. There we go. It ate my symbol. That's like, like people especially, like I already have enough trouble convincing people for one point x, this many points y. If I go, well, this many standard deviation units x, this many standard deviation units y, like people just glaze over like. So if you're wanting to explain it to someone in plain English, b is better. Because it tends to have like a fairly graspable meaning. For this many points to this one, this is going up or down. But if you want to compare two coefficients to each other that aren't in the same scale, beta is better. Okay, so beta is for comparison, b is for explaining. So we use beta when we want to compare. I use B when I want to explain it to somebody, what happened. Because <clears throat> um, that makes them comparable. They're all, now on a z-score scale, so I have a better grasp of like these two compared to each other. So which one's a better predictor? GPA, previous GPA is slightly better predictor. Because lots of people don't go to sessions. Uh, this thing. I skipped over this line. So if you only have one x and one y, um, beta, b, and r are all the same. So with, that's not a with, with one x, one y, b, r, and beta are all the same. <coughs> b is the slope between x and y. R is the correlation between x and y. We have one x, one y, b, and r are the same. R is a standardized coefficient. It is beta. So that's why when people have one, uh, just they just want to know one x, one y, they just do correlations. Because this is all the same. Why make it more complicated by using regression? So really, regression is better for multiple predictors. Because then they're not the same. And then that's where we get into the discussion of R, 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 and R. Okay. Oh, after Y hat. Let me do Y hat first. So what is Y hat? Y is their real score. Okay. So my real score. Y hat is what I get, my guess at your score. So obviously I'm not perfect at getting their scores. So here's my predicted score for this person, but they actually scored a little lower. That's their actual score. I predicted this person's score here, but they did really well in the last exam, so they're way up here. So y hat is where you fall on the line. Y is your actual score. And it's important to have both of those, because what we're going to do is correlate those, and that's where the R, 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 and R discussion comes in. So if my regression equation is good, I'm very close to predicting their scores. So y and y hat are close together. My regression score is bad, why am I had a far apart? Because okay, then you're just taking a wild guess. So when you make these plots, right, we want most of the dots to be close to the line. Because that implies that we're doing a good job at predicting. The dots are all very far from the line, we're not doing so good. Y hat and Y. So for every person we calculate a predicted score. And we take these two things and uh, correlate them. So we're going to talk about R, little r, big R, R squared, PR, 
Is that PR first? No, that's our first. <laughs> SR and PR. All the R's. I would say on this quiz, this is the most missed section. So, let me see if I can make it hopefully pretty clear. Little r here is 1x, 1y. It is your normal correlation. <clears throat> this correlation we've been doing this whole semester. It's your interpretation of correlation is that. <coughs> so that, that is not a new r. The new r is big R. Big R is for two or more x's and one y. So it's the correlation between y hat and y. This is the correlation between x and y. If I have one x and one y, we calculate the correlation between them by looking at if x goes up with y or x goes down with y, or there's nothing. But if I have multiple x's and one y, then you're like, wait, how do I make that into one score? So what we do is we create the regression equation and we weight them. So some x's are better than others, so they get bigger weights or bigger slopes. And so we create a weighted score, um, which is y hat, the predicted score. So here's what I think your score should be based on all of these x's. So it's a way to take all the x's and combine them into one. The interpretation of B, remember, is for each one unit increase in that only that variable. Here's Y going up, ignoring all the rest of them. What R does is it allows us to say, here's the increase or decrease in Y, given all the variables at once. And we're mostly going to use this as an effect size. So it's the correlation between X and Y, or it's a multiple correlation, is often what it's called. So really, the only distinction between little r and big r is the number of x's. Little r is 1x, because it's little. It's only got one. Big r, two or more. <coughs> now, r squared is the amount of variance uh, between all the x's and y. And that's big, so it's multiple x's. <coughs> I, have a, I have a Venn diagram here in a second. So we're going to use r squared as the effect size. r squared and eta squared are the same <coughs> damn thing. Mathematically calculated exactly the same. I don't know why we treat them as different things, but we do. So r squared is the same interpretation as eta. It's the amount of variance. It's, it's 0 0.01, 0 0.09, 0 0.25, same rules, they're the same. Okay. R squared is easier to type, it's not a special symbol. That's all I got. <coughs> so, what does that mean? Okay, here's my Venn diagram. We're getting to here in a second. Let me do SR and PR first. Oh, SR. So, SR is a semi partial correlation. Because just r and r would be too easy. So essentially what happens is we get this big r squared. So I know the overall correlation with all of my variables and y. So that tells me sort of like in a big picture way how useful are all of my variables. So I was using um, previous GPA and um, number of sessions to predict y. And what r squared or r tells me is those two together. If I wanted to look at them individually, that's where SR and PR come in. So this is looking at X by itself. In self? It self? It, it. Sorry, that's a it self. Where are you guys at? May not be able to see that. Uh, these are all X's together. The Y2 sets, one of them is like all the X's, and one of them is like, okay, I got lots of X's, let's just do one of them. They're kind of post hocs. There's this kind of the same step down procedure for regression as well. So, this is the omnibus test 
These are the post hoc cynicisms. But the definitions of them suck, putting it nicely. So semi-partial correlation is 1x uh, and 1y uh, holding the other x's constant. <coughs> How much variance does that variable count towards the total, uh, knowing that there are these other ones out here? So people often talk about this as a unique contribution to r squared. So how much does r squared increase when you add this variable? So sort of seeing like, if I'm going to take r squared, I'm going to break it down into parts. This much goes to this x, this much goes to this x. Um, so it's a way to say sort of partial r squared, but don't call that partial because the next one's called partial. Okay. So this one's semi-partial. <coughs> partial, because people can't come up with good names, is 1x and y ignoring the other x's. <coughs> so the other x's are taken out, or here the left in. Hopefully the Venn diagram will help with this idea in a second. <coughs> so it's how much does that variable add, ignoring the fact that these other ones are there. So not holding them constant, including them. It's like taking them out. How much does this variant variable add? So it's a proportion of variance in Y not explained by other predictors, whereas SR is the proportion of variance in Y in addition to the other predictors. <laughs> so we're calculating the denominators are different here. Um, because the denominators are different, SR will always be less than PR, unless they're zero. <coughs> so we have a special package called PP Core, which always makes me laugh. We'll use to calculate these two. You don't get them automatically. You do get them automatically in SPSS, but they're called part and partials. Which one would you guess was part and which one is partial? Every time I pull up that chart, I'm like, oh god, part and partials. Part is semi-partial, partial is partial, but it's really confusing. So I'm glad the function forces you to remember which one is which. So <coughs> let me see if I can explain these a little better, this time with pictures. <coughs> so we've got two IVs and the DV. So the blue stuff is the DV. This may not be super easy to see in the back, but I've got IV1 and IV2, and I've labeled each section. Um, so with regression, when we get to multicollinearity or additivity, we'll talk about you just don't really want your IVs to be correlated. Because as your IVs get more and more correlated and C gets bigger, you're wasting your time. Because uh, the larger the overlap between IVs, the less important each IV looks by itself. So in a perfect world, our IVs would be uncorrelated, just like with ANOVA, but they're going to account for a lot of this error variance, or variance in B. So big R um, is the correlation between uh, your IVs and your DB all together. So it's B, C, and D. So you get all three parts, B, C, and D, over the total variance. So it's all accounted for variance over total. Um, versus R, and this is just R for IV1. So for IV1, it's just, you know, pretending the second one doesn't exist at all. It's just B and C over A, B, C, D. So individual variance over total. Okay, so for IV2, it would be B and C over ABC. 
So we're just ignoring the other IV. Okay, we didn't take it out. We're just pretending like it's not there. So obviously, by adding uh, one of these variables in, so we've got R1, by adding in the second variable, we've got D. So we've added that in. Okay, that's SR. So SR measures how much extra do you get by adding that second variable. So I've already got B and C under IV1. So now, how much extra do I get? That's D for IV2. To match the one I have on the board, if I have IV2 already, so C and D, I'm getting B is the extra. So for SR, it's essentially new stuff over total. So that overlap doesn't count, just the new stuff. So when your variables overlap a lot, SR is going to be small, even if R is big. So it's just the new stuff over the total. PR is your new stuff over just the leftover stuff. We're going to call that error. So between R and SR, the, the numerators are different. Between SR and PR, the denominators are different. So you'll see that PR is just B, the new stuff, over A. That's why it's always bigger, because it's got a smaller denominator. So it's just uh, the new non-overlapping stuff over what's left over. This is what I mean by it's taken out. So essentially the formula is like C and D have disappeared. <coughs> They've gone to the Bermuda Triangle. Okay. We just have B and A left. Whereas with SR, C and D are still there as part of the denominator. So it's holding them constant as opposed to taking them out. <coughs> People like PR better because it's a bigger number. True story. <coughs> Because it tells me how much uh, variance is unique to that predictor over just the error. These are very similar formula-wise to uh, eta and partial eta. So SR is very similar to eta. All right. Here's how much extra you're adding, but it's still over the total. PR is essentially partial eta squared. How much extra stuff you're adding over just the error. So they, they mimic familiar predictors. All right, that's one of the hardest parts, is getting the difference between mainly SR and PR. <coughs> All right, so questions here. So this will mostly be, like, we'll calculate SR and PR, um, but mostly this is like a test question. If I give you a diagram, can you tell me what that's R and what's PR? Hopefully. Nothing yet? Okay. <coughs> okay, so that's all like the nitty gritty of regression. Like, here are different variables we're going to calculate. So I'm going to step up and talk about the types of regression. <coughs> so these are the things we'll actually run. <coughs> so under the regression umbrella, oh, it's a flow chart. Look out. We have correlation. This is also where simple linear regression fits. So correlation and simple linear regression are the same thing. Remember that uh, beta, r, and b are all the same. Uh, it's called simple reg linear regression, or SLR, because there's one x and one y. Okay, and they're all continuous. We also have a nova out here. 1x, multiple x, blah, blah, blah. ONOVA breaks down to like 600 mm -hmm. types, right? And this is where they're categorical. So this is us dealing with continuous variables. I drew this really badly. Oh, well. <coughs> um, so simple linear regression, 1x, 1y. So we'll run one of those just to get us started on multiple regression. So then there's MLR, which is X is and Y. 
one way. Things we'll do next time, or in another class period, not next time, a log regression where the X is and Y, but Y is categorical. With ANOVA, X is categorical. With log regression, Y is categorical. And if you just want to go totally nuts, structural equation modeling, lots of X's and lots of Y's. So all this, well, we can do MONOVA, which is several Y's, right? But essentially single Y's to lots of Y's. It's all still regression. So this class really should be called regression. Okay. <coughs> um, oh, also EFA. We're going to do some EFA. So factor analysis is cousins with SIM. It's still SIM in a sense. <coughs> exploratory structural equation modeling essentially, but we call it exploratory factor analysis instead. <coughs> but anyways, we're here. So MLR. This is mostly what we we're going to do examples from. So more than one X and Y, we can mix and match variables. So we can be categorical, we'll try one of those, continuous. You'll see why we like ANOVA. I know you may not love ANOVA right now, but you'll like ANOVA after you see how miserable it is in regression. Um, and the best part of, to me about MLR is the figuring out which IVs are the most important. So we can look at an overall model and then do post hocs, in a sense, which are which IV was best. Um, and that's a lot of what I do. Okay, now on this of this section, I'm mainly going to ask you what are the types and well, how are they different. So some of this nitty gritty is just more for explaining. Under SL, MLR, there's three. Oh, uh, wait. Well, I lied to you. We're going to talk about five. <laughs> this is going nuts. All right. So simultaneous, I'm not going to call it SLR so you don't get confused. Sometimes it's called standard regression or simultaneous regression. Um, and this is where you do all the variables at once. So I think my regression professor explained it as throwing things against the wall and seeing which ones stick. Um, so this is all the variables at once. Each variable is assessed on its own. So um, we're essentially evaluating its SR bigger than zero. So does that variable add a unique contribution? So is this B or this D? The C doesn't count better than nothing. That's what we're asking. So do they add a unique uh, prediction to the equation controlling for the other variables? Um, if you have two very highly correlated DBs, sometimes what happens is the one that has the biggest SR will get all that variance. Depends on the type of regression you're running. And this is where suppression comes in. Okay. And I can do that. So if I have my DV here, and I have IV1, and then I add IV2, and they overlap a lot, R will be big and SR will be small, and nothing will be significant. So if you have a regression equation, where the R is a big number and it's significant, and then each variable is non-significant. This happens, it's really weird. Uh, that's suppression, because they're canceling each other out. Because individually, on their own, ignoring the overlap, they're not doing much. So this is why you gotta check for additivity. Because at that point, the two IVs will also be highly correlated. So I have a good example for that. Yes. Um, so suppression is when I have two very highly correlated IVs that are both good at predicting the DV, but nothing looks significant. Uh, so simultaneous is all at once. Hierarchical or sequential is one at a time, or part steps at a time. Hierarchical is one of these words that just like sucks to spell. I can't spell it right. My word always corrects it for me. Sequential to me makes more sense. Steps. 
So this is regression entered into sets, sometimes to sets or steps, either way. And you look at the variables in the step that they're entered. So what I could do is control for something and then test. So um, for example, uh, Liz, who's a second year athletic trainer, is working on predicting satisfaction with athletic trainers. I wouldn't, you know, why, I don't know why she's interested in this, but she would like to know if people are satisfied with her. Um, and so she's got a, a model that's set up in steps. So we're controlling for this team size. Oh, can I remember all her variables? So many variables. She has like five steps. Uh, and then the second one's personality, and then like comfortableness, and some other stuff that I can't remember. Um, so she has that broken down into steps. So I'm going to first control for this, then look at this, then look at this, then look at this. Um, within each step, they're only assessed because of the other things in the equation. So when you control for something, it doesn't, uh, it gets to count against what's in that step and not the next step. But the second step is against all the first variables, and the third step is against all these other variables. So it kind of, as you go, the variables get uh, more competition, so to speak. So the test against SR, uh, and then as you go, it's, it ends up being PR. Okay, so they only get what's left over variance wise. <coughs> but why would you do this? I have two slides on this one. Um, the reason that we use hierarchical regression really is because of uh, an, you have an order in mind. Uh, so I can control for nuisance variables and then test this stuff, or I can, I have a specific order I expect things to work in. Uh, so we've done some where we controlled for age and gender, and then looked at um, PTSD, and then looked at meaning in life. So we had the specific, we want to control for these things and then see how much extra does this add, right? Um, <coughs> or you can do things in sets. So if I have several variables that are very highly correlated and I can't convince the research team to eliminate one of these damn variables, even though I've told them six times, don't do this, instead you do a set. That's a fine, you want both variables in there, that's fine. So instead of treating them as like this variable and that variable, we treated the whole thing as one block of variables. Um, had been surprised, meaning scales are highly correlated because they're all testing the same thing. And imagine this, depression and PTSD are also highly correlated. So we treated them as sets of variables instead of their own unique things. That was the compromise. Um, and then they wanted to run react interactions that I was I hated. So um, we process each set and not each individual predictor. <coughs> so another reason to use hierarchical. Uh, most people use it as an ordering procedure or a control. And we'll do some examples of these next time. The last type I'm telling you about so you don't do, and if you do one, you can just pretend like you didn't. It's called stepwise. So I cringed, cringed when my friend asked me to help him with a paper where we had to do stepwise. I'm like, but I always tell my students never to do it. Ah. Um, so stepwise regression, another SLR, because that's not confusing. Um, is where it's a hierarchical regression, they're entered in steps, but instead of you controlling the steps, math controls the steps. So you kind of just throw them all in and it picks either the biggest one first, or uh, backward is where everything's thrown in and the uh, smallest ones are removed first, and then stepwise, stepwise regression is where there, it's kind of, it goes back and forth. So sometimes the predictor will come out of the equation and then another one will come out and this one works again, so it comes back in. So it's like people entering and leaving a room constantly, you're never sure who's gonna be left at the end. Um, the reason that we don't tend to do this in psych is because we're very theory-oriented science where theory drives our hypothesis testing and what we would expect to run. And this is a very math-oriented approach. So um, I guess we like a little more control. So these variables should be important. Step stepwise regression is just like, let's see what happens. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, what we used it for was we had a, a questionnaire, a long questionnaire, 
and we used the, the question to predict the total. So we were trying to figure out which question was contributing most to the total. So it was still a little theory. They made me do it. Right. But the reason we don't tend to do these is because we want to have theory drive our hypotheses, not math. <coughs> but they are a thing. <coughs> Um, we're going to add these two in just a second. So uh, the purpose of MLR, and this is how we're going to write them up, uh, is how good is the equation? So where our purpose is to make this equation, and we can do all variables at once or variables in steps. Uh, but I'm going to get this overall F statistic. that tells me how good is my equation or my model. Uh, can I predict people's scores better than chance? Okay, better than guessing. That is written like an ANOVA F statistic, and we're going to use R squared for the effect size. If that is significant, we'll look at the predictor <coughs> individually, or depth. And that's where we're going to list uh, B, T, and P. And we'll use P R squared as the effect size. That looks a lot like ANOVA. Right? Is the overall all model significant? Is the omnibus F significant? If yes, then post hocs. So if yes, then look at the predictors. The nice thing is the predictors are just, they just spit right out. You don't have to. Uh, run extra stuff until we talk about mediation and moderation. Then you do. Um, but it's the same, the same basic idea as ANOVA. Overall model to uh, mean differences for ANOVA. For us, it's overall model to predictors. And that's because ANOVA is regression back to same procedure. Okay. And they're T values, so you go from F to T. Same thing we did for ANOVA. Remember, a post hoc is still a T. Okay. Woo. So, two special types of MLR, moderation, I'm out of room, mediation. So we're going to try both of these. Yay. There should be small yays. Yay. Okay. No. You're all like, uh, oh, it's Monday. <clears throat> Monday's after long weekends, too. <clears throat> so mediation, let me start with the picture, actually. <clears throat> Mediation, so I have a video on my YouTube channel about mediation in SPSS, and I, I make the, the third wheel joke. Y'all understand, like, there's a third wheel in the room. Like, that's apparently a really good American idiom. And I had someone ask me about it, and I was like, oh, right. That's probably not going to translate if English is your second or third language. They're like, I think you mean this. I'm like, I do mean that, but that I was using a, a metaphor, sorry. but. Mediation is about the third wheel, since we all mostly have English as our first language. Um, and what we're doing is we first are assessing the relationship between X and Y. Uh, is X related to Y? So that's a simple correlation procedure, right? And if X is related to Y, can we change that relationship by adding M, which is the mediator? Um, and so this is the set of procedures we'll do for it, and we'll go over this more when we actually do an example. But it looks at the relationship between X and Y, and then sees what happens when you add M into the equation. And what we're hoping will happen, in mediation anyway, is that the relationship between X to Y will stop happening and start going through M. And so it's almost like a diversion, like we want this roadway to stop, or it's got construction, I don't know. And we're diverting through M instead. So we're basically arguing a path. So mediation is about the path of the relationship. I think that might help explain so you don't get these two confused. So it's saying that X to Y is a thing, but really it's not X to Y. There's a third variable in the middle, X to M to Y, is really what's happening. So we're going to break that down into paths. We're going to talk about the C path, which is X to Y. Then we have to make sure X and M are actually related. So do these roads connect? That's A. M to Y is B. 
So we still have to, if we're going to take this route, we still have to have um, a relationship between M and Y. And then what we want is C and C prime to be different. Okay. So C is sort of just X, Y here. And we want the relationship between X to Y to change with M. Does that make sense to people? So yeah, the third wheel idea. Like I, I guess I never had that moment of like, oh yeah, that won't make sense to non-American people. Um, and if I add an extra variable, something happens between X and Y. Uh, and the something happens is you want the, vari the relationship to get closer to zero. You want x to y to go away. Because I get asked a lot, like, I put m in the equation and x to y got stronger. Well, I'm like, oh, you shouldn't be doing mediation. Like, but it changed. And I'm like, that's great, but that's not the right direction. So we want x to y to go away. If x to y gets stronger, you're actually talking about moderation. The mediation is the, the, we're redirecting the relationship between X and Y. So a road example. Moderations is interactions. We've been doing interactions a lot. We have to break them down for postdocs. We have to do what's called simple effects. This is called simple slopes. So moderation is looking to do interaction between X and Y. So at different levels of X, we have different slopes. I'm sorry, different levels of M usually, different slopes for X to Y. So let me do, uh, I don't know that I have a great example of mediation. So MSU GPA predicts G course GPA, course class grade, right? But if I add sessions in, this isn't true, but if I were to add sessions in, it should redirect to the grade. So grades would no longer predict. It would be grades predict if you go to sessions, which then predicts if you're your grade. Um, and so essentially we would say grades don't really predict course grade. Grades predict whether or not they're going to get help. And whether or not they're going to get help predicts course grade. That's not true. That's not how it works. So the M is add on? Added on. The pathway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think about mediation as a like, this happens to this, which then happens to this. So it's like a step procedure. Whereas moderation is like different levels of things. Um, so moderation is where I'll have different slopes for different levels of a variable. So this is like the smart kids have a different relationship between help and grade than the less smart children. That's not a good way to put that. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> so people with lower GPAs, I'm not relating this to intelligence. Right. Uh, what we're hoping will happen, I actually ran this right before we came to class, but um, is that people with lower GPAs get helped more by sessions. That would be a perfect world, right? Because those are the people we're trying to target. People with high GPAs, great. You do your thing. But we're trying to get people on the lower end to come up. So they have a higher relationship of help to sessions, uh, to grades. And then the smart kids, the higher GPAs, have a it helps them less. Um, I don't know how it really works because I didn't get to run that part, but it's at different levels of the variable, we have different slopes. So what you get are this fan effect. Okay, so this is complete now, so I'm gonna it. Should have thrown. Oh, no! What? I can tell you about a paper. Oh, oh, oh! I'm not on the internet. Damn. Oh, wait. But I have it. <laughs> wait. I have my own publication saved on my computer. Of course I do. Um, let me tell you about men and drinking. That's a great, my good moderation example. Let me tell you. Men and drinking. <laughs> this is true. This is published. So, here's women. What we did was we measured, well, I, I got added on into this later, but it's a long story. So uh, they measured um, uh, meaning in life. It's in my friend that does logotherapy. So this is a continuous meaning in life. This is alcohol use, um, and this is at a big party school. So the alcohol use is actually up in the scarier range of the school. Um, and then here's depression. So what we did is we split depression up into groups. It's really a continuous measure but we created these slopes for them. 
And for women, it doesn't matter what level of depression they are at, right? The relationship between meaning and alcohol is slightly negative, no matter what. So there's no moderation. So pretty much like they're all the same. The more meaning they have, the less they tend to drink. But for men, you get this weird fan effect. <laughs> That's moderation. So at different levels of depression, you have different relationships between X and Y. So at high levels of depression, the more meaning you have, the more you drink. And that was like really hard to explain. At low levels, the more meaning you have, the less you drink. But once you hit that high group, or that high set of people, the, the higher the meaning. So it was like high depression and high meaning, there was a lot of boost. <laughs> That's moderation. Mediation is like, it would be depression to meaning to boost, and that doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so I forgot I had that example. <clears throat> so mediation is about the path. Moderation is about the levels. All right, a couple more slides, and then we will ask in COVID questions. Uh, and this is going to be about outliers. So we're getting back into the technicals. So data screening remains generally the same. There are some new rules for outliers. We'll get to those in a second. Additivity is about the correlations with the IVs. With additivity, we've been doing CVs or DVs. Now you want the IV and the DV to be correlated. So don't exclude an IV if it's really correlated to the DV because that's the point. But two IVs that are highly correlated are going to cause you suppression problems. Normal, linear, homogeneous, all the same. But this is regression, so there's no fake analysis. So we kind of get to skip a little bit of a step. We're going to run the real one. So no fake stuff. So let me talk about outliers. Still going to do Mahal and Obus. We're going to do two new things. So we've got Mahal, you know how to calculate, plus leverage, plus cooks. There are actually about 20 different procedures. These are the three most popular ones. So if I have my, back to my SI example, so help predicting final course grade. We clearly are kind of a little, sometimes all over the map on predicting people. So leverage, a person that has high leverage influences the slope. So you can think about leverage as like a jack to your car, right? So you gotta get enough leverage so the car comes up, mm -hmm. right, to change your tires. Um, leverage is someone who, with including that person, are going to significantly change the slope. So they tend to be very far from the line because then the line has to adjust to including them. Okay. So it's how much influence they have over the slope. Their score is change B. There's a new cutoff rule. It's 2K plus 2 divided by N. K is the number of predictors and the number of IVs. N is the number of people. Uh, and that's a static thing. It doesn't change based on, it changes based on the number of IVs. Just like my hollow nose. <coughs> uh, so cost scores for leverage tend to be very low, like 0 0.02, 0 0.01. Right? So they tend to be kind of small. <coughs> uh, discrepancy are people that are far away from the line in any form. So I can be discrepant, but not have leverage. That's usually when you have a big gap in the data. So I have a couple of people that are just kind of way out here, and I don't have anybody in the middle. These peop this person is also discrepant. So this is both, really. Um, and this is a little bit of both. This one, if I drew it more like here, would be just leverage and no discrepancy. They tend to go together. It's not perfect, though. 
So to measure discrepancy, we're going to use Cook's. Cook's is actually a measure of leverage and discrepancy, but includes, it's like, there's no one discrepancy measure. So let's cut off this four divided by degrees of freedom, so n minus k minus one. It's all in people, k predictors. And what we're going to do is use the best two out of the three. So if they have two problems, they're gone. So we're not going to use any one thing. Well, if it's been doing Mahalanobis is greater than cutoff score, you're out. Right. Now we're going to do if they have two problems out of the three. Uh, and why? It's because outliers, uh, they, they do have a big effect on the mean, but I would argue they have a bigger effect on, um, on slopes. So they cause a lot of error in one group. So I've got to figure out who they are in that one group. So I have just Mahalanobis. But we don't really have groups anymore. We have these continuous measures. So I have several different um, predictors going on. So I've got to figure out if their predictor scores are an unusual pattern. That's Mahalanobis, right? Um, but also, how much are they changing my slope? So slope is the most important thing to me, usually. So we're going to use more than one. <coughs> so if you've got two out of the three or three out of the three, you're out. Well, this could be a good baseball joke, but it's just it, you know, that would be only two strikes. So. Uh, we'll talk about how to do each of these. And then the last, this should be the last thing, yeah, is categorical IVs and regression. So let's say you do have several continuous variables and you have one stupid categorical variable that you've got to deal with. Okay, so you want to use ethnicity or something. Um, one thing you have to do is make sure that it's coded as a factor in R or it will interpret it as continuous. So if I had... Um, religion, we have religion that day, like Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, and it coded them as one, two, three, four. It would assume that one, two, three, four meant one, two, three, four, and that would put, like, alphabetically would put Catholics as one and other as last. But it doesn't make any sense that way. So you have to make sure they're factored. If it's factored, R will automatically create you categorical columns, special columns called dummy coded columns. Did I write dummy coded? Did I not use that word at all? Okay. Be sure it's called dummy coding. Okay. Um, so what happens is it creates these sort of fake comparisons. They're not fake. It creates these comparisons. Um, and whoever is coded as the lowest group gets to be the control group. I'm going to make this a little clear. So let's say I have a factored variable where we had our religious example. So we had Catholic, let's see, alphabetical order, so it would be Jewish, L M N O other, and then Protestant. Because R codes things alphabetically sometimes. Whoever's coded as the first group gets to be the comparison group. So in regression, it will create me a comparison of this one to this one, this one to this one, and this one to this one. So I will actually get three predictors. Even though it's one variable, I'll get three predictors. Because it automatically does uh, pairwise comparison for you, but not all of them at once. This is why ANOVA is easier. Uh, so whoever's coded as first, you'll get three comparisons against that one. If you wanted every single pairwise, so I do want to see Jewish to other, you have to recode and run it again. And we'll do a little example, a very simple example of this so you can kind of see how it works. Okay. But that's called dummy coding. The nice thing about R is it dummy codes for you. Phew, you just have to do it by hand. Okay. <clears throat> so practically, the next couple of days we'll be working through simple and my, uh, uh, multiple regression and then dummy coding example. And then next week or so, we'll do one day for mediation, one day for moderation. <clears throat> and then we'll move on to log. Yay.